On behalf of the Kulin and the Augustma families, I'm happy to welcome you to this marriage ceremony. We've come here in the presence of God and before his people to unite Zach and Lydia in marriage. Let's ask the Lord for a blessing on that in prayer. So we pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we praise you for making and redeeming us to live together in love. And we thank you for the love and trust which brings Zach and Lydia to this, their wedding day. Favor them now with the honor of your presence and unite them by your spirit so that together they may reflect the love of Christ for his church and the church's devotion to Christ, her Savior. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And who gives this woman to this man? Her mother and I do. And as Zach and Lydia come forward, let me invite you to be seated. Whereas married persons are generally, by reasons of sin, subject to many troubles and afflictions, you, Zach and Lydia, who desire to have your marriage publicly solemnized in the name of God and in His church, may nevertheless be assured in your hearts with all certainty of the assistance of God in your afflictions, and therefore hear from the Word of God how honorable the marriage state is, and that it is an institution of God which is pleasing to Him. Wherefore also he will, as he has promised, bless and help, help married persons, and on the contrary, judge and punish fornicators and adulterers. In the first place, you are to know that God our Father, after he had created heaven and earth and all that is in them, made man of his own image and likeness, and God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the beasts of the field, the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air. And after he had created man, he said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord had taken from man, he made a woman from and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. Therefore you are not to doubt that the married state is pleasing to the Lord, since he himself made a help meet for Adam, brought her, and gave her to him to be his wife, witnessing thereby that, as with his hand, he still brings to every man his wife. For this reason, the Lord Jesus also highly honored the marriage state with his presence, gifts, and miracles in Cana of Galilee. Thereby the Lord shows that the marriage state is to be kept honorable by all and that he will always aid and protect married persons even when they least deserve it. To the end that you may live godly in marriage, you must know the purposes for which God has instituted the same. The first is that husband and wife faithfully assist each other in all things that belong to life in time and in eternity. Secondly, that they bring up the children whom the Lord may be pleased to give them in the true knowledge and fear of God to his glory and their salvation. Third, that each of them may live with a quiet and good conscience, avoiding all impurity and evil lusts. Fourth, to avoid, uh, or rather four, to avoid fornication, Scripture teaches us that every man have his own wife and every woman her own husband, so that all who are, to come, who are come to their years and have not the gift of continence are bound by the command of God to enter into the marriage state with the knowledge and consent of parents or guardians and friends and to live in all holiness with each other in this state so that the temple of God, which is our body, may not be defiled. For whosoever defiles the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Next, you are to know how each is bound to behave towards the other according to the word of God. You, are, you who are the bridegroom must know that God has sent you to be the head of your wife that according to your ability, you shall lead her with discretion, instructing and comforting and protecting her as the head rules the body, yea, even as Christ is the head, the wisdom, the consolation, and the assistance of his church. Besides, you are to love your wife as your own body, even as Christ has loved his church. You shall not be bitter against her, but dwell with her as a man of understanding, giving honor to the wife as the weaker vessel, 
considering that you are heirs together of the grace of life and that your prayers be not hindered. Furthermore, since it is God's command that the man shall eat his bread in the sweat of his face, therefore you are to labor diligently and faithfully in the calling wherein God has set you, that you may maintain your household honestly and likewise have something to give the needy. In like manner, you, the bride, must know how to conduct yourself in relation to your husband according to the word of God. You are to love your lawful husband and to honor and respect him and to be obedient to him in all lawful things as the Lord your God or as to the Lord your God as the body is obedient to the head of the church to Christ. You shall not exercise any dominion over your husband for Adam was first created, then Eve, to be a help to Adam. And after the fall, God said to Eve and in her to all women, thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over you. You shall not resist this ordinance of God, but be obedient to the word of God and follow the example of godly women who trusted in God and were subject to their husbands. For example, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. You shall also be a a help to your husband in all good and lawful things, looking after your family and walking in all honesty and virtue without worldly pride so that you may give example of modesty to others." Wherefore, Zach and Lydia, having understood that God has instituted marriage and what he commands, do declare before God in his holy church that it is your sincere desire to enter into this holy estate after this manner, and do you desire that your marriage be solemnized. Zach, what is your answer? I do. Lydia, what is your answer? Then let us come together in praise of God by singing, God himself is with us. You'll find that in your programs, the three stanzas as they're listed in your program, God himself is with us.
before the Lord then in prayer. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, as we now are privileged to hear and witness the vows of Zach and Lydia, we pray that you would give them truth in their hearts, that these words would be your words issued from hearts, made new by the power of your Holy Spirit, so that these would be more than just words, but the reflection indeed of their deep commitment of love to each other and their desire to demonstrate to all the world the glory of the gospel. For truly, as we have just heard as well, Lord, in the love of a husband and of a wife, Christ and his church is pictured before us. And in that picture, we see the great blessing of fellowship with you and the redeeming work of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so bless, O heavenly God and Father, the vows they're about to make and establish them by your grace and goodness in Jesus' name. Amen. And I'm going to invite Zach and Lydia to face each other and repeat after me. I, Zachary Joseph Kulin, acknowledge here before the Lord and his church that I take as my lawful wife Lydia Yanni Elgersma, you're present. Promising never to forsake her, to love her faithfully, and to maintain her as a faithful and godly husband is bound to do for his lawful wife. That I will live in holiness with her, being faithful and truthful to her in all things according to the Holy Gospel. Hi, Lydia Yanni Algersma. Acknowledge here before the Lord. And this is Holy Church. And I take as my lawful husband, Zachary Joseph Kulin, your present. Promising to love him, to be obedient to him. <laughs> <laughs> that's the wrong that's the wrong time to laugh <laughs> to, serve and to serve and assist him never to forsake him, never to, forsake him. To, live in holiness with him. to live in holiness with him being faithful and truthful to him, being faithful and truthful to him in, all in all things as a godly and faithful wife, as a godly and faithful wife is bound to her lawful husband, according to, the Holy Gospel. according to the Holy Gospel. I invite you to present your resolutions. Zach. Zach, do you give this ring as a symbol of your constant faithfulness and abiding love? I do. Lydia, do you give this ring as a symbol of your constant faithfulness and abiding love? I do. Then in accordance with the ordinances of God and the civil authority vested in me by the province of Ontario, I now pronounce you husband and wife. And may the Father of all mercies, who of his grace calls you to this holy state of marriage, bind you in true love and faithfulness and grant you his blessing. Amen. Hear now from the gospel how firm the bond of marriage is. As described by Matthew 19, the verses 3 through 9. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that, which, that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. Whatever God is joined together, let not man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? And he said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, 
and shall marry another committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. Believe these words of Christ, and be certain and assured that the Lord God has joined you together in this holy state. You are there to, therefore to receive whatever befalls you therein with patience and thanksgiving as from the hand of God. And thus all things will turn to your advantage and salvation. Amen. You may kiss the bride. Then we're going to sing together. Now from Psalter 255, we're going to sing the stanzas one and three. One and three of Psalter 255. Let's pray. Almighty God, thou who dost manifest thy goodness and wisdom in all thy works and ordinances, and from the beginning has said that it is not good that man should be alone, and therefore has created him an helpmeet to be with him, and ordained that they who were two should be one, and who dost punish all impurity. We pray thee, since thou hast called and united these two persons in the holy state of marriage, that thou wilt give them thy Holy Spirit, that in true love and firm faith they may live in holiness according to thy divine will and resist all evil. Grant them thy blessing as thou hast blessed the believing fathers, thy friends and faithful servants Abram and Isaac and Jacob, Grant them thy grace in order that they, as co-heirs of the covenant which thou hast established with these fathers, may bring up their children, if it pleases thee, to give them in the fear of the Lord, to the honor of thy holy name, to the edification of thy church, and to the extension of thy holy gospel. Hear us, Father of all mercy, for the sake of Jesus Christ, thy beloved Son, our Lord, in whose name we conclude our prayer together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may stand. Hear now the promise of God from Psalm 128. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways, for thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. 
Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by thy side in thine house. Thy children shall be olive plants round thy table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children, and peace be upon Israel. The Lord our God fill you with his grace and grant that you may live long together in all godliness and holiness. Amen. And at this time, I'm going to invite John Verdonk to come forward and present the wedding Bible. Zach and Lydia, it's uh, my privilege to present the Wedding Bible to you today, and as I like to do, I like to read a a few verses that speak to the great blessing of God's Word and and being in the Word. And so I selected a, a few verses from Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. So a few, a few short verses, and yet we see how uh, the blessed individual um, is active in, in God's word, as we see in verse 2, meditating day and night. And... Um, as we do that, we, we can enjoy um, that picture that we see in verse 3 of a, of a tree that is healthy and strong, is, whose roots are deep, planted by the rivers of water, bearing good fruit. And so that's my, my prayer for the two of you as you uh, begin your married life together, that God's word would be precious to you, and that most of all, that uh, the blessed fruit of the Lord Jesus Christ would be um, preeminent in your life, and that you would... Uh, see the Lord Jesus in his word, and that you would um, grow uh, in the love of our Savior each day. And so that's my prayer for you. And let's join our voices again in singing. We're going to sing those words from Psalm 128. We'll stand to sing all the stanzas of 360, 360.
We're going to read together from the first letter of John, all of chapter 4. In my Bible, that's found on page 1867. 1867 is where my Bible, in any case, has 1 John 4. It's almost at the end of the Bible. We're going to read the whole chapter, but it's especially the verses 7 through 11, and maybe especially 10 and 11, that will form our focus. Having our Bibles open, let's ask the Lord for a blessing upon the reading of his word. Shall we pray? Gracious God and heavenly Father, your word is rich in its power, wonderful in its beauty, and great in its message of salvation in Jesus Christ. But we are dim, our hearts are hard, and our minds, Lord, are weak. We are easily distracted, and we do not always hear the wonders of your love in Jesus Christ. So we pray, Heavenly God and Father, now remove distraction from us, open our hearts to receive the implanted seed, and whether we be unbeliever or believer, may we not leave this place unchanged, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. So then 1 John 4, beginning at verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Now, especially these verses, to verse 11. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love and he who abides in love that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. That's for the reading of God's holy word. Again, it's the verses 7 to 11 and especially then the verses 10 and 11 that are our focus for this service. Zach and Lydia, family and friends, and everyone gathered here, both from Wellinport and from Zion, to celebrate this wonderful occasion, to rejoice with this couple and their families in this momentous moment in their walk with the Lord and in their journey of faith and service. You've chosen a a well-fitting and a beautiful passage for this, your wedding day. Especially if I can say that, at least in the context of our world, the second half of verse 11. In fact, if you had said, can we have 11b as our text, everybody would have been happy. Absolutely everybody, including me. 
It would have said, because it says there, we also ought to love one another. And I don't think there's a person alive that doesn't agree with that. That's, that's the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you'd have done to yourself. That idea, love each other, that's true in every religion. It doesn't matter what religion it is. Anyone who's come here, if you're not Christian, if you're anything else, surely you can agree with that. We ought to love one another. That's a vital and a, a foundational principle for all of life. Love is, is so important for all of us, not only in terms of our, our, our relationships, our marriages, our families, but for our own health, our own mental health, our own emotional health and well-being. We need love. The Beatles know it, right? They sang that all we need is love. Even Rafi knew it. He said we need a song in our hearts, food in our belly, and love in our family. And if you've ever met someone that has been born in a broken home or, or raised in a very difficult situation where there isn't love, then you realize that love is more important than food. It's more important than uh, physical well-being, that... that that to be filled with love, to be encouraged by love, to be equipped by love, to be strengthened by love is a vital human necessity. We are a people that must love and must be loved. And so you've chosen a very good passage for your wedding day, a passage that challenges not just Zach and Lydia to love each other, but challenges all of us today as well to love each other and to love each other in light of the necessity, the need of it, the vitality of it. We need to, if we can borrow our world's language, we need to choose love. We need to live by love. And we need to walk in the way of love. But there's a small problem. You didn't choose 11b as your text. If that were all that they asked me to speak on, we could all just go home now. It's all good. Just love each other. Off you go. It's good. But what do we mean by love? What does it mean to love one another? Now things get a bit dodgy, a bit difficult. Uh, when your parents were much younger, they may have listened to the same music I did when I was much younger. And one of the singers when I was a teenager, Alana Miles, has a song in which she asks, what, or she deals with what is love. And she says, love is whatever you want it to be. I have a feeling that's a fairly accurate description of love for our culture and for our world. What is love? Well, love is what everyone needs. Love is what everyone should be given. Love is what everyone should experience. But what is it? Well, whatever it is, whatever makes you happy, I think that in the end is what love is, whatever makes you happy. And that's what, what our world believes. That's what our world, if you watch our world, if you listen to our world, if you listen to its music and its art, if you listen to its music and its, or its movies rather and its literature, you begin to discover that love is really my self-fulfillment. That, that I need to love in order to be a full human being, but I need to be loved too. And if you don't love me, if I'm not loved, then my life is difficult, it is dreary, it is depressing, it is oppressed. That's the language of our culture today. That's the way our world sees things. If we in any way use words or actions to in any way diminish the value, to deny the worth, to question the identity of any other human being, we do them violence, we hate them. And, and hate, you know, is a terrible thing. I think we would all agree with that. Hate's a terrible thing. Hate lies at the root of almost everything that there is bad in this world. Hate obviously is the cause of war, the cause of murder. We know that the Word of God teaches us that. That the sixth commandment, which says you shall not murder, finds in Jesus' hands a, a, a deep revelation concerning our own hearts when he says, if you hate your brother, then you have sinned against the Lord, then you have sinned against the sixth commandment. Hate is an awful thing. It's, it's what causes oppression. It is what causes pain. It's what causes divorce. 
Hate isn't something we, none of us want. We all want love, no hate. And our world tells us they're on side. Yes, we want love. We choose love. No hate, only love. But what is love? How do we understand this love? Well, John helps us understand what this love is in the verses that precede 11b. And, and they're very hard verses in many respects. 11a, just think of it this way. He says, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love each other or one another. So John says, you ought to love each other. Love is vital for every one of us, vital for marriages, obviously, vital for any relationship. But the love that you are to show to each other, he says, is the love of God, the love that God has shown to his beloved. Right? It's not just to anyone. There is a sense in which we can speak of God's love for all of humanity, for the existence of the world, for the persistent seasons that pass and the provisions of creation. We can speak in those senses of God's common beneficence, of his general blessing upon the earth. But when we're talking about the love of God here, it's a more particular love. It's a love for a very specific group of people, for those beloved, for those whom God has loved. And those whom God has loved have experienced a rich blessing in a very specific way, a way that we're now to imitate, that is to bind you together as husband and wife. The way that you're to love each other, according to this word, is the way God has loved you. Well, that's, that's, that shouldn't be too hard, should it? Well, it gets worse. In this is love, verse 10, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That is, of course, really just the gospel, isn't it? That is John 3, verse 16 in some sense, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The word propitiation there might be a difficult word for us, but it's a word that is rich in significance for us as believers. It's a reminder that all of us have been born into this world as rebels, as those who hate, that the hate of which we uh, speak in this world, the hate that causes oppression, the hate that causes divorce, the hate that causes wars, that hate is born in all of us by our nature, that we are that by virtue of being rebels, that we ate the fruit in the beginning. We know the story of Genesis 3. We sinned against the Lord, and in sinning against the Lord, brought ourselves into judgment. And because we are rebels against God, God is angry with us. Sometimes we, we don't like to talk about that aspect of reality. It's on display all around us. We know that it's true. And we have to be honest about it. We have to deal with it. We're never going to understand the good news if we don't understand the bad news. We'll never see the glorious uh, night sky in the Milky Way as it casts its light across the night sky unless it's very dark out. Diamonds shine brightest against the black velvet of the jeweler's cloth. Love needs to be understood in the context of our sinfulness in the context of our rebellion against God. We shake our fist at God. We say to God regularly and routinely, and this isn't true just for unbelievers. This is also true for everyone here, believer alike. We so often say to God, no. You tell me to serve. You tell me to surrender. You tell me to sacrifice. No. You tell me to offer my life in praise of you. You tell me to give my time in service to you. No. You are not worthy of my devotion. You are not worthy of my... I know we don't like to say that. We don't like to admit that, but that's the truth. Sin is an act of rebellion against God. It is not just some minor mistake against some rule written somewhere, some silly ancient rule that, that really has no meaning. It is an affront and an assault on God whereby we say to God and of God, you are unworthy. And we are all born into that reality. We all continue to struggle with that reality, each and every one of us. And now imagine that. Imagine the truth of who you are in the light of what God's word is. Join David in saying, Lord, your judgments are just. I know the truth of who I am. I don't like you. I don't like your will. I don't like your word. I don't like living for you. I like my desires. I like my attitudes. I like my, my plans and purposes. I like to live my way. Selfishness is not something we have a problem with. Pride is not something we need to cultivate. Greed comes to us without difficulty. We are this. This is who we've become by virtue of our rebellion against God in the beginning. 
But when God looked at us in that condition of rebellion and rejection and refusal to acknowledge him, our constant shaking our fist at him like some rabid dog trying to bite the hand of its master, he didn't pull out his gun and put us to death. When he looked at the wickedness that dwells in us, he didn't say, you know, if I give them a second chance, if I give them a I know they can do better. You don't give rabid animals a second chance. But God did something amazing, miraculous, and awesome. He looked at us in all of our misery, in all our rejection of him, in all our, all our rebellion against him, in all of our refusal to live for him, and he says, I'm going to love these people. Well, already we have a very different perception of what love is than what we hear of in our world. Because if this love were the love that our world spoke of, there'd be no country music. Country music's all about dogs leaving, trucks breaking down, girls going away, going away, breaking up with them. There'd be no country music if this was love. If what 1 Corinthians 13 said was true of our world, that love never fails. But love does fail in our world. Love fails all the time. Marriages end. Relationships break up. Friends become enemies. Why? Because it's not this love, is it? It's not this love of God, this God love that looks at a sinner in all of their wickedness and says, I still choose to love you. And choosing to love you, I will do all that is necessary to save you. Not, not just, I choose to love you. It's, it's easy for us to think that's a thing we can do. I can choose to love someone, but can you do all that is necessary to bless them? Do you have no one in your life that causes you grief, that demands of you more than you ask, can, I, can offer rather? Do you not have a, a friend or a, a loved one who is struggling with addiction or that is struggling with pride or that is struggling with some other aspect of sin that makes it hard to love them? Those kind of people that I describe as emotional black holes. You talk to them and it's like your energy just gets drawn out. And you go, you know, I, I just can't hang out with this person anymore. I can't be with them anymore. I, life's too short. God looks at us and says, I know the depths of your despair. I know the extent of your wickedness. And I choose to love you and to do what is necessary to save you. And to do what is necessary meant, you understand, the sending of his son, his eternal, eternally begotten son, his beloved son, who dwelt with him in eternity and who fellowshiped with him in glory and whom he loved and who loved him. And he sent that son to take on the flesh of his creature. That alone ought to boggle our minds. But he took it on that he might nail it to the cross and drink the cup of wrath that we deserve. The anger that God poured out on Jesus was the anger we should suffer from. That's what God's love does. It commits to blessing, does what is required for that blessing, even though it cost him his own son. And more than that, he, then having received his son in heaven itself and accepted the sacrifice presented by Christ, he pours out his Holy Spirit so that we might be transformed. The passage spoke about that as well, didn't it? Talks about how we are also made new. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, the regenerating power, the new birth. We who are born into sin and into death are born again into life and into righteousness by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit so that these rebels, these rabid dogs, these enemies of the Lord who refuse in every way to love and serve him become his sons and daughters. Become his sons and daughters. Chapter 3, just before this, opens with those very encouraging and familiar words, don't they? Aren't they? Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Those are the beloved of God, the loved of God. Those are the ones to whom then John speaks at the beginning of chapter 4. Beloved, 
he says. Verse 7, beloved, he says. Verse 11, beloved, he says. You who have been called children of God, who have been made by the redeeming work of Jesus Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, alive to live for the Lord, have been delivered from the darkness of sin and the wickedness of rebellion, who have been drawn into the glory of God by the power of Jesus Christ. You, says John, are to love each other the same way. That's where it gets tough. Everything to this point in verse 10 is great. God loves me. That's encouraging. He's redeemed me. That's wonderful. Washed me in the blood of the Lamb. What a peace I can know. Given me His Holy Spirit that I might walk with Him. Indeed. So God says, now love each other the way I've loved you. Wait a second. The way you loved us, God? Obviously not in the exact same way. We can't die on the cross as the incarnate Son of God for the sins of His people, but... We certainly can sacrifice, can't we? Indeed, isn't that what love requires? On a day like today, it's easy to love each other. You look so good. It's easy to love on your wedding day. It's easy to love when your partner is serving you, blessing you, providing you the things that you need or want, your expectations being met. But what happens when they're selfish? What happens when they screw up? What happens when they sin? As we all do, then what? Then how do we love each other? In the tough moments, in the difficult moments. See, that's where the the love of our world falls short. That's where it ends. It loves for a time. It may even love a little past that, that difficult time, but eventually it says enough. You are not worthy You're not deserving. You are too much of a drain, and I am unable to love you anymore. The friends that once called us friends suddenly forget us. The family that once showed its affection to us now flees from us. But it's in that moment that the Christian is distinguished as a believer, as a child of God, because in that moment they love. They love for they have been loved have been loved out of a commitment to bless and to do what is required to bless, even to the sacrifice of self. Indeed, no greater love is a man than this, than that he gives his life for his friends. That's what we are to love. That's how we're to love. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to be a child of God. He who does not love at love in this way now, love in this self-sacrificial, persistent, to the end of time way, is not or does not know God, for God is love. And in this, the love of God was made manifest toward us that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. It means that that the love that you are bound to, that you are called to, that you've committed yourself to is a very difficult love. It's not the love that everybody agrees with. It's not the love of which our world speaks, of which the Beatles speak, of which Rafi speaks. It is the love of God in Jesus Christ. But the good news is you've come here as believers. You've come here as children of God, born again of God. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says to you and about you in Romans 5. There he speaks about having been justified by faith and how we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope, and all those good things. But it says in verse 5 this, now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. It's a lovely saying uh, in our faith, in the Christian faith, that the Lord gives what he commands. So he commands you to love each other. And he commands you to love each other as he's loved you, sacrificially, with a commitment to blessing, in a way that sees each other uh, draw closer to the Lord, serve more obediently in his kingdom, uh, glorify his name more wonderfully, make each other to praise your God for all that he's done for you. That's what it means to love each other. But that's a hard thing to do. It's a very hard thing to do. If only you had said 11b, it wouldn't be so hard. But you said the whole thing. But the good news is that 
The Lord who commands this of you also gives you his grace to do it. He pours out his spirit into your life that you might fulfill the vows that you have made. Indeed, that's the comfort, that's the confidence and the hope that we have as you live out now these promises you've made to each other. Is anyone equal to these promises? Can any of us fulfill these things? I don't think so. Not in ourselves, certainly. And if we think we can, we have a problem. We're going to find ourselves at the end of our rope pretty quick. But when we come again into God's house, for example, and we see and hear the good news of the gospel and what God has done for us, and we see again his love, and we experience again the outpouring of his Holy Spirit, for in the worship of God's people, the Spirit of Christ is given to his children. We are equipped to do this very thing. When we feast at the Lord's Supper, when we think upon our baptism, and we remember the grace that God has poured into our lives, then we know that we have the strength to do these things, that the Spirit has promised He will equip us in these moments. When you think, I can't do this, the answer is, I know, you're right. But the Spirit of Christ in you can. And so depend upon Him. And that means be in His Word. That means be in prayer together. It's not for nothing that we give you a Bible at the very outset of your marriage. Right? That's where we find the strength and the hope and the help to fulfill this call. And it's such a high and holy calling to demonstrate to the world that you are the beloved of God, to show the world that you're his children, that you're born again, and that your marriage is distinct, different, unique. It's not like the world's. It is a love that never ends. It is a love, as the apostle reminds us, that more excellent way It is a love that suffers long and is kind. A love that does not envy, does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It's a love that bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. It's a love that never fails. So rejoice in the grace that God has given you. Recognize that the calling that you've been Given today as husband and wife is a calling you can't keep. It would just feel good about each other, maybe. But it's serve and sacrifice for each other. And look to the Lord for your help and strength. That the world may know that you are the loved of God, the children of God, redeemed in his grace. Let's thank him for that in prayer. Shall we pray? Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. A very challenging word. It is easy to think we can love. But Lord, when we think about what the standard of love is in the light of your word, indeed, when we think that Jesus Christ is the standard of love, then we realize how little we love one another, how quickly we are to despise each other, think ill of each other, gossip about each other, allow our minds to turn over the failings of others so that we learn to hate them. That's our world, Lord. That's our world and its tensions, its tribal affiliations, its social struggles, mental anxieties. There's little wonder, Lord, that our world is falling apart the way that it is. But, Lord, you've given us the source of love, your very heart itself in Jesus Christ. And by your Spirit, you pour out into our lives that love by which we can love one another. We pray for Zach and Lydia now, Lord. May they forever find themselves crying out to you for mercy upon their knees before your throne of grace in prayer and in devotion, within your house of worship, seeking your mercy and your love so that they might be able to fulfill the calling you've placed upon them, the command that you've given to them. For you have called them to love each other as you have loved them. And this is beyond their ability to do, but not beyond yours. So hear our prayer and bless them now, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Then we're going to sing again and we'll stand uh, from our programs again this time uh, in Christ alone. As our programs have it printed, we'll stand to sing all the stanzas.
And at this time, we're going to sign the marriage register. time. Now the two stanzas of How Deep the Father's Love for Us, the stanzas one and three, and we'll stand again to sing one and three of, uh, on our program sheets, How Deep the Father's Love for Us.
And there remains but one thing to do, and that is to introduce for the very first time Mr. and Mrs. Zach and Lydia Kulin. <laughs> 